Maharaj, please accept my respectful obeisances. All the to you. All the to Prabhupada. So, just give a quick intro, only to maybe a minute. Zorana Chandra Mauli Swami Maharaj, born in New Jersey, USA in 1947. And came in contact with the uh, International Society for Christian Consciousness in Denver, Colorado at the age of 24. 1973, he began practicing Christian consciousness in New York City. Shortly thereafter, began serving at the New Vrindavan farm community in Western Virginia. Same year, he received initiation from his divine guest, S.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami 1986, Maharaj accepted sannyas and began preaching in Cincinnati, Columbus, Ohio, and many other preaching in his prison ministry. Maharaj is preaching very actively and uh, all over the world, Maharaj is preaching. So, thank you very much, Maharaj. So fortunate to have you today. So please take it on. Take it on. Okay, so um, how do we do this? Do you put the verse up on the screen and I read it, or do I just speak on the verse? Or what? You can share, Maharaj, uh, this verse, and then you can do that. Or Namru Prabhu, you are able to share and do the screen. Here of the verse 19, 32, 33. I'll, I'll um, share Okay. And then uh, we have to leave time for questions, correct? Yes, five, ten minutes. Yeah. Or if you want to speak until ten and take questions five, ten minutes, that's also fine, Maras. Okay. I'll, yeah. Um, I have to quit exactly on the hour because I have a I have a class at the temple coming on right after that. So. Okay, so then, yeah. then in the case, uh, maybe 8.50 or 8.55, you can take it, and then five minutes, uh, leave for questions. Yeah, yes, okay. Nice. okay, so, uh, yeah, let's share, we put this verse up, and I'll we'll read the uh, verse. So we had Hare Krishna Prabhuji, we're doing 1931 to 33. 119, right? 19 or Okay, this is now we're in the middle of a pastime where Bhishma Dev was just encountered the Lord. And uh, now he's laying on the bed of arrows and he's about to, well, He's about to instruct King Yudhisthira for 18 days. But now he wants, well, actually he's done that. Yeah, he's done that. Now he's about ready to leave and he's speaking his heart. Sri Bhishma Uvacha Iti Matir Upakal Pita Vitrisna Bhagavati Satvatam Pugave Vibhumni Svasukam pagate kochit bihartum prakritim upe yusi yad bhava pravaha. Translation. Bhishma Dev said, Let me now invest my thinking, feeling, and willing, which were so long engaged in different subjects and occupational duties, in the all powerful Lord Sri Krishna. He is self-satisfied, but sometimes being the leader of the devotees, he enjoys transcendental pleasures by descending to the material world. Although from him only, the material world is created. Srila Prabhupada's purport a little lengthy, but because Bhishma Dev was a statesman, the head of the Kulu dynasty, a great general leader of Kshatriyas, his mind was strewn over so many subjects. 
and his thinking, feeling, and willing were engaged in different matters. Now, in order to achieve pure devotional service, he wanted to invest all his powers of thinking, feeling, and willing entirely in the Supreme Being, Lord Krishna. He is described herein as the leader of the devotees and all-powerful. Although Lord Krishna is the original personality of God and he himself descends to earth to bestow upon his pure devotees the boon of devotional service. He descends sometimes as Lord Krishna as he is and sometimes as Lord Chaitanya. Both are leaders of the pure devotees. Pure devotees of the Lord have no desire other than the service of the Lord and therefore they are called sattvata. The Lord is the chief among such sattvatas. Bhishma Dev therefore had no other desires. Unless one is purified from all sorts of material desires, the Lord does not become one's leader. Desires cannot be wiped out, but they have only to be purified. It is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 10.10 10 by the Lord himself that he gives instruction not for any material, gives instruction from within the heart of a pure devotee who is constantly engaged in the service of the Lord. Such instruction is given not for any material purpose, but for going back home, back to Godhead. For the ordinary man who wants to lord it over material nature, the Lord only sanctions and becomes a witness of activities, but he never gives the non-devotee instructions for going back to Godhead. That is the difference in dealing by the Lords with different living beings, both the devotees and the non-devotee. He is the leader of all living beings, as the king of the state rules both the prisoners and the free citizens. But his dealings are different in terms of devotees and non-devotees. Non-devotees never care to take any instructions from the Lord, and therefore the Lord is silent in their case. Although he witnesses all of their activities and awards them the necessary results, good or bad. The devotees are above this material goodness and badness. They are progressive on the path of transcendence, and therefore they have no desire for anything material. The devotee also knows Sri Krishna as the original Narayan because Lord Krishna by his plenary portion appears as Karanaudaksai Vishnu, the original source of material creation. The Lord also desires the association of his pure devotees, and for them only the Lord descends to the earth and enlivens them. The Lord appears out of his own will. He is not forced by the conditions of the material nature. He is therefore described as the Vibhu, or the Almighty, for he is never conditioned by the laws of material nature. Namaste Saraswati Devi Govani Pachari Nemir Shisha Sunya Vadi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakopa to Rubes Chakri Pasindu Deva Chapati Tanganam Bhavane Bio Vaishnave Bhyona Mahona Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So here, Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, Yeyatam Mantra Padyante Tams Tataiva Bhajani Aham. Mama Vartmana Vartante Manusha Partha Sarvasya Aham. As you approach me, I reward you accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. Here it says Krishna is Vibhu. He is the master of all. He's all powerful and he is also Sattvata. He is the leader of all the devotees. That is, everything is coming from him. And he is, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, 
Bhaktaram Yagya Sapa Sam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suhidam Sarva Bhutanam Yanta Mam Shanta Murchati. Krishna is the friend of all living entity and he only acts for the welfare of all. And here it talks about reciprocation, how the Lord uh, reciprocates according to how one approaches. And Prabhupada gives a complete distinction between two categories, devotee and non-devotee. The devotees, they want to serve the Lord. They want to develop their love for the Lord. And therefore the Lord, as is mentioned, um, yes. 1010 Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, as you, uh, I'm situated with everyone's heart. And um, accordingly, uh, if one worships me with devotion, I give them the understanding by which they can come to me. So a devotee doesn't worship the Lord for something material. <laughs> Although the devotee may be engaged in material activities, these are not his goal in life. His goal in life is to develop his relationship with the Lord and ultimately achieve the perfection of that relationship or the success of that relationship, and that is to return back to the spiritual world. Here we see Bhishma Dev. Now he has done everything he should be done in his life. Uh, he helped raise the Pandavas. He fought on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And now um, he's also given instructions to Yudhisthira on how to manage the kingdom. After, you know, once he's taken that position, everything is done. And now he is uh, thinking all of my material activities, everything that I've done in life, that is not even a concern of him. Now he wants to simply absorb himself fully. That full absorption into the Lord is called meditation upon the Lord, or in the intense form of that meditation, it's called samadhi. Complete absorption in with a devotional mood onto the lotus feet or onto the lotus form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And one who can achieve that is, has reached perfection of life. Therefore, life's activities are meant to bring us to that consciousness gradually. We perform our activities in this world along with cultivating our Krishna consciousness, but our activities should not take away our desire or our attention away from Krishna. Uh, if they do, then they become counterproductive. Therefore, one has to learn how to live in this world and at the same time practice Krishna consciousness. And that's the process of bhakti you know, given by the spiritual master. And that's a very, what we say, detailed and intricate subject matter, just for the sake of mentioning it, because we see here that Bhishma Dev, he's done everything that it was required for him in this life. Now, none of that becomes important anymore. His last desire was somehow to reciprocate with Krishna in loving relationship. And because he's in the mood of chivalry, he arranged for Krishna to fight with him by uh, fighting so powerfully that Arjuna was knocked off the chariot and the chariot was broken. Even Krishna fell from the chariot. So then Krishna understood what was to do next. So he came at Bhishma Dev, not with his chakra, but with the wheel of the chariot in the form of the chakra. It was almost like he was carrying the chakra, but it was actually the wheel of the chariot. And Bhishma Dev was so happy. And now I've got the chance to reciprocate because he, his rasa with Krishna is in chivalry to fight with Krishna in a lovely way. And um, so Krishna fulfilled his desires perfectly and completely. And in being uh, pierced by the arrows of Arjun during that encounter, he is now uh, laying on the battlefield. 
Bhishma Dev is a powerful personality. He had the uh, boon given by his father, Shantanu, that he could leave the world at his own desire. In other words, death could not conquer him. He had already received that benediction that he could choose when he decided to leave. Of course, a pure devotee of the Lord doesn't want to stay in this world forever. They want to stay here as long as they have to in order to do their service to the Lord and become purified. When that, when that stage of consciousness is reached, then going back home, back to Godhead, or giving up all material activities and focusing fully on the intention of the Lord. Because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, yam yam vapi smaram bhavam tattva ante kalevaram, the one who remembers me at the time of death will attain to my abode, our Arjun. So he promises, so life is a meant to cultivate that consciousness of Krishna. So when the time of death comes, one can absorb himself fully in Krishna and not make plans to somehow or other, uh, you know, proliferate their material life, like giving orders to their children to do this and to do that and to do this. And I haven't finished this plan yet. Please finish it for me. Uh, uh, I wanted to do this. Maybe you can do it for me. In other words, we see those who are not Krishna conscious or maybe even partially devotees, they still are very much attached to this world and still think when it's time to go, uh, yeah, maybe I should make a whole series of plans and then everything will be accordingly. But he's leaving. He won't be around to see any of the plans like that. So that attachment comes very strongly. But one has to learn to cultivate that mood of devotion and detachment simultaneously because within the consciousness of loving Krishna and serving, serving Krishna throughout the life, a mood of detachment from material activities naturally and, and progressively develops more and more. And then when it's time to leave, then the devotee thinks there's nothing else, just Krishna, and that's it. Um, of course, even before one comes to that, that time in life where one, the body is about to end, one should be free from all of the attachments in this material world. And that's, that's the process of devotional service. So Bhishma Dev is giving us a lesson here and great souls, when they perform activities, they teach also us about the messages of those activities, what we can learn from their activities. Because everyone by, by nature is a pure devotee. Pure devotional service sits in the heart of all living entities. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Saru Kabumai. Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte Kodiye Joy. In the hearts of all living entities, pure love for Krishna is there. It's the, as Prabhupada would say, the birthright of every living entity to become fully uh, in love with Krishna. And so that is the whole process of devotional service. And Bhishma Dev is giving us the uh, most important instructions what to do at the time of departing the body. And that is the most important instruction. We get so many instructions throughout our own life, but unless we know how to depart from this world, then we may also wind up, wind up coming back again. So now he says, let me invest my thinking, my thoughts, my feelings, and all of my desires, which were so much scattered throughout subject matters in my life. Now let me place them all at the lotus feet of the Lord. So this is the perfection of life. Uh, so Bhishma Dev is teaching that principle in this particular verse. Okay, we can, I mean, we can speak about this verse uh, more and more. And one, one more principle that should be mentioned 
Uh, although Krishna loves the non-devotees just as he might loves the devotees, Krishna's love is equal, as he says in the Bhagavad Gita, Samoham Sarvabhuteshu Namedvesis Sinatriya. He is not uh, partial to anyone. He's equal to everyone. But um, as the people approach him, he reciprocates. So the non-devotees don't approach him for devotion. The non-devotees are interested in gaining something from the material energy, which is Krishna's energy. So they're more interested in what Krishna can give them more than what, what uh, Krishna is. In other words, just like sometimes you see in the family, uh, family members will be, they're not, uh, the children are not so much interested in their parents, but what they can get from their parents. <laughs> And sometimes their parents are wealthy and they're all, all thinking, maybe I'll, soon I'll get that wealth also. So that's not really a good child. The real child is the one who actually loves and serves the parents in such a way that the parents um, uh, are pleased according to how the children should, should serve. But we see nowadays people are interested in what they can get, not really the person who was actually given. So that's the non-devotees. They're only interested in, in what Krishna can give them and not in him himself. So therefore, Prabhupada says, for the non-devotees, he doesn't give them any instructions them to go back home, back to Godhead, because they're not qualified to receive them those instructions. Although his love is complete and perfect, he loves each and every living entity perfectly, but still he reciprocates accordingly. Okay, so uh, if you want, we can go on to the next verse, or we can take questions on this verse and then go on to the next verse. What would you rather do? Maybe you can cover the next verse also, Maharaj, and then we can take questions. Okay. Okay, we'll do the next verse. Next verse is more about Krishna. Tri Bhuvanam Kamanam Tamalam Vanam Ravikaram Gaura Vada Ambaram Dandane Kapur Alanka Kula Vrityanam Bhujam Vijaya Sake Rata Astume Navadya. Translation Sri Krishna is the intimate friend of Arjuna. He has appeared on this earth in his transcendental body, which resembled the bluish color of the Tamil tree. His body attracts everyone in the three planetary systems, upper, middle, and lower. May his glittering yellow dress and his lotus face covered with paintings of sandalwood pulp be the object of my attraction, and, that, and may I not desire fruit of results. Okay. So the Prabhupada's purport, these purports are quite lengthy. When Sri Krishna, by his own internal pleasure, appears on earth, he does so by the agency of his internal potency. Retractive features of the transcendental body are described in the three worlds, namely upper, middle, and lower planetary systems. Nowhere in the universe are there such beautiful bodily features as those of Lord Krishna. Therefore, his transcendental body has nothing to do with anything materially created. Arjuna is described here as the conqueror, and Krishna is described as the intimate friend. Dev on his bed of arrows after the battle of Kurukshetra is remembering the particular, particular dress of Lord Krishna, which he put on as the driver of Arjuna's chariot. While fighting was going on between Arjuna and Bhishma, Bhishma's attraction was drawn by the glittering dress of Krishna. And indirectly, he admired his so-called enemy, Arjuna, for possessing the Lord as his friend. Arjuna was always a conqueror because the Lord was his friend. Vishmadev takes this opportunity to address the Lord as 
Vijaya Sakke, a friend of Arjuna, because the Lord is pleased when he is addressed conjointly by his devotees who are related to him in different transcendental universe. While Krishna was the charioteer of Arjuna, sun, gray, sun rays glittered on the dress of the Lord. And the beautiful you created by the reflection of such rays was never forgotten by Bhishma Day. As a great fighter, he was relishing the relationship of Krishna and his chivalrous humor. Transcendental relation with the Lord in any one of the different humors is relishable by the respective devotee in the highest ecstasy. Less intelligent mundaners who want to make a show of being transcendentally related with the Lord artificially jump at once to the relationship of conjugal love, imitating the damsels of Rajadam. Such a cheap relationship with the Lord exhibits only the base mentality of the mundaner because one who has relished conjugal humor with the Lord cannot be attracted to worldly conjugal ras, which is condemned even by the mundane ethics. The eternal relationship of a particular soul with the Lord is evolved. A genuine relationship of the living being with the Supreme Lord can take any form of the five rasas and it does not make any difference in transcendental degree, degree of the genuine devotee. Bhishma Dev is a concrete example of this, and it should be carefully observed how the great general is transcendentally related to the Lord. So as Prabhupada ends the purport, it should be carefully observed how this great personality, Bhishma Dev, is transcendentally related to the Lord. So you see from the beginning, he's observing the beautiful form of the Lord and the uh, ornaments of the Lord, how he's dressed, his lotus face is covered with paintings of sandal with pulp, like that. The sun, it's mentioned in the purport, the sun was reflecting off of Krishna's very sparkling dress, and um, Bhishma Dev was finding uh, that to be very attractive to see the Lord says here, the sun ray glittered on the dress of the Lord and the beautiful you created a reflection of such rays that was never forgotten by Bhishma Dev. So here, his, this is his meditation. He's, although he's absorbed in fighting with the Lord, he's meditating on the beautiful transcendental qualities of the Lord at the same time. And he's also thinking how fortunate and how great Arjuna is to have Krishna as his such a dear and intimate friend. So all of these things are going on in Bhishma's consciousness uh, while he's uh, on the battlefield with Krishna. And he addresses the Lord Vish, Vijaya Sakke, friend of Arjuna, like that. So uh, this is very pleasing to the Lord when the Lord is addressed in relationship to those that are dear to him. If you address Krishna by his name, that's beautiful, that's nice, and that is acceptable. But if you address Krishna by something that is dear to him, so you say, you say, Gopi Janavalaba, he is the, uh, he's the one who gives unlimited pleasure to the gopis. Or if you say, Nanda Nandana, he is one that's very, who gives pleasure to his father, Nanda Maharaj. So these are in more intimate uh, names of the Lord because they reflect his loving relationships with his devotees. So this is the meditation that Bhishma Dev is undergoing. So in this particular verse, we get a little, we get a indication how attractive the Lord is, even when he's in the fighting spirit, this is interesting. Of course, for Bhishma Dev, the fighting spirit of Krishna is his ultimate absorption. As it's mentioned in previous verses in these series of verses, uh, that Bhishma Dev is in the chivalry ras. Uh, there are five main rasas, 
and there are seven subrasas. Um, it's interesting because he says, uh, Vijaya Shaka, Sake. Sake means friend, so that is Sakya Ras. But it doesn't put the Bhishma Dev in the, in, the, in the category of the cowherd voice, Sakya Ras. He has that friendly relationship, but his sub Ras is the superior mood of his relationship with Krishna. In other words, he enjoys the chivalrous mood of being with Krishna or associating with, interacting with Krishna. But he considered it at the same time friendly. <laughs> so sometimes the, uh, and it's mentioned in the nectar devotion, sometimes the sub rasas become more prominent than the main rasas in certain times. Usually it happens incidentally and not continuously. But we have in this case with Bhishma Dev, it's more of a continuous mood of devotion that he's in his mood of chivalry. And he teaches that rasa also to others because he is also not only a um, great devotee of the Lord in that mood, but he also is one who teaches that same loving relationship with Krishna as it's mentioned in previous verses. So each and every devotee has a particular mood of relationship with Krishna in one of the five rasas. Generally, the four main rasas, either Dasya Ras, Sakya Ras, Vatsaya Ras, and Madhurya Ras. And as we execute devotional service, strictly under the guidance of our spiritual master, gradually we start to realize a little bit each more and more as we make advancement, what is my actual relationship with Krishna? Mm -hmm. It comes by way of realization through absorption in devotional service. But in order to enunciate it, or what we say uh, validate it, Prabhupada would say that is that at a certain point the spiritual master will appear to the devotee and uh, reveal the devotee's eternal relationship with Krishna, which is called your istate, sometimes called Siddha Pranali, uh, eternal loving relationship. Every every living entity has a fixed loving relationship with with the supreme personality of Godhead in one of two realms of existence, either in the uh, Goloka Vrindavan, or Vrindavan mood, or in the mood of uh, Vaikuntha, uh, in the Vaikuntha realm, you'll see that even many great devotees who associated with Krishna and with uh, Lord Chaitanya had relationships with uh, the Supreme Lord in the Vaikuntha mood, in the Narayan feature of the Lord, or we know it also as Ram Lila, Vishringa Lila, like that, or many of the other Lilas that are of the realm of the Vaikuntha realm, which are numerous. There's such a variety of manifestations of the Vishnu and the Narayan forms that one can be in any one of them. But generally, as devotees in the ISKCON movement, Srila Prabhupada makes this point in the Bhagavad Gita, we worship Krishna as the Supreme Personality, the Godhead, that boy who, came, who appeared in Sri Vrindavandav playing on the flute, standing in three bold bending waves, surrounded by his loving associates in the mood of intimate uh, loving relationships. And Prabhupada said, we are, because we are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is teaching us the mood of Sri Vrindavan Gang, like that. Now you might say, what, what happens if my relationship with the Supreme Lord is fixed in something of the Vaikuntha realm, and I'm practicing to develop my relationship with Krishna in the Goloka um, 
Well, then the answer is that at one point during your progress in spiritual life, Krishna, as I mentioned, will reveal exactly what is your eternal relationship with him. So we cultivate and we follow Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's process, which is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, as prescri prescribed the mountain grounds every day on the beads, and uh, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and also the philosophy and practice of Krishna consciousness that's mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion and in the Bhagavad Gita and other works by Rupa Goswami, such as Upadesh Amrita. So, uh, yeah, and then, uh, so Bhishma Dev, he's aware of his eternal relationship with Krishna. And that'll also become a feature of our consciousness as we make progress in devotional service. We'll get indications and we'll start to find that hearing the pastimes of the Lord in the particular, his particular leaders become more attractive than others. As we progress on the path, we will get more and more attracted to hearing the Lord's leelas in a, in a particular way. Although the attraction may be there for all of the leelas, something outstanding becomes prominent in the devotee's practice. So this uh, next verse is, um, he, it follows the previous verse now, that absorption that Bhishma Dev talked about in verse 32, now he's actually reflecting, he's actually not reflecting, but he is actually uh, absorbed in that as he reveals the beautiful transcendental form of the Lord and the uh, absorption in that form. Okay, so we can stop here. I guess it's about 20 minutes for discussion. So if there's any comments or questions, we can. Thank you so much. Dear devotees, raise your hands. We will start with something uh, reflecting on the, these two verses. Maharaj, as you pointed out, for Bhishmadev, he worked... Uh, so hard and so many years, Vishnadev um, directly in touch with the Supreme Lord, directly in contact with the Supreme Lord, he is able to see face to face and he is uh, contemplating and he is able to communicate and he is referring here, uh, Ambaram Dadane, glittering. We were in the opposite completely. We are attracted by the external beauty, but rather here Vishnadev is completely attracted by the uh, beauty of the Supreme Lord, completely opposite. And he is mentioning Anavadhyaya. Uh, uh, without diversion or deviation from the material desires, but we have the completely opposite. But for him, he was able to come to this uh, and is a Mahajan, but we are at, uh, so insignificant as myself. So how, what is the practical way, maybe quicker way, uh, uh, what is the best ways we can somehow progress uh, at uh, some pace than the uh, much slower pace and uh, <laughs> yeah, there is a fast track and that's that is to absorb yourself more and more in hearing and chanting the glories of the lord in association with great devotees one who hears and chants the, the glories of the lord becomes nectar that nectar becomes so attractive to both the mind, the heart, and the ear. And then as the verse goes on, this is spoken by Kapila Dev in the third canto, that then, then real bhakti, real bhakti starts to develop within the heart. So we are all, we are all naturally attracted to Krishna. We have that loving attraction, but it's covered by our association with the external energy. To awaken that attraction is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord more and more, and to serve the devotees of the Lord at the same time. These two things are the direct and most powerful of forms of awakening that attraction to Krishna. 
In fact, by associating and pleasing devotees, then uh, automatically we get an attraction for the Lord because the devotees who live their life based on the service of the Lord, when they are pleased, then they bless us with, uh, with Krishna consciousness. So these two things, associating and serving devotees and especially hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. We got so many books, we can read about it. We can, we see it on videos. We have different ways to, um, and to view and hear about the, the glories of the Lord. And because Krishna is Krishna, means, the word Krishna means all attractive. He, when we uh, become more and more attuned to that process of hearing and chanting his glories, our attraction will naturally, and I use that word with emphasis, naturally awaken <laughs> more and more. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Damrita Anubhav has a question. Maybe if we have time after that, we can share some um, experiences from the prison ministry and those who are, are captured in prison but had transformational effect and how they are able to take out the unwanted anaddas in the heart. And maybe it will melt our hearts. But let's go with Damrita yeah. Um, I would like to make, uh, make a humble request, if I can. And I always like the devotees to turn on their videos so I can see who I'm talking to. <laughs> because yeah, it becomes very personal when, when we see actually the audience. Yes, Maras. Amrita, I'm go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for sharing your realizations and wisdom. It was a very nice class. Maharaj, my question is related to the first verse you spoke about. Um, there are devotees, non-devotees, and there are non-devotees who are on the path of trying to become devotees, someone like me. So whenever there is an upheaval, something like a family member seriously ill, um, then we pray to Krishna. Because we realize that, okay, demigods are actually servants of Krishna. So rather than go to this demigod or that demigod for a benediction, you know, you go directly to Krishna. So we pray to Krishna, you know, please take care of my brother or whoever it is. Uh, but that's a material requirement. So uh, is that okay to do it? Or, and if Krishna does grant it, won't it create a sense of... Um, greed, if I may say, that would then take us further away from our devotional service. Then rather than asking Krishna, give me service, I'll be going for him little this, little that, do this, do this, that for me. So how does a devotee handle such situations? Or trying well, to Shira, be a devotee? Yeah, Srila Prabhupada taught us how to pray for others. And uh, when it came to when Prabhupada was sick in 1974, uh, the devotees wanted to pray to Krishna. The Prabhupada instructed us how a prayer should be offered. And the prayer is, uh, my dear Lord Krishna, if you so desire, please, using your example, please cure my family member. You can be very specific about that. But in that element, that statement, if you so desire, you know, in other words, a devotee doesn't ask anything material from Krishna, but out of concern for someone, he may be the spiritual master, maybe a friend, maybe someone, some person, just uh, an acquaintance or something. Um, they can, we can pray like that, but then again, you leave it up to Krishna. This is what I want, but I want what you want. That's the move. <laughs> So the aftermath, Maharaj, whether that request is granted or no, you remain undisturbed. Well, the thing is, Krishna always knows what to do. You have, we have to have that faith that the Lord is perfect. And he, he sees the whole picture. He doesn't see just what we see. Mm -hmm. So sometimes he will cure the person. And sometimes 
he has another plan for that person. So that's why we leave it up to him and rather than asking him what we want. We, we can express our feelings and our desires, but we don't um, request him to fulfill them. We say, this is what I want, but what you want is really what I want also. <laughs> if you so desire. Sometimes someone is being sick and they're, they're being gradually brought back to the spiritual <coughs> world. We can't see that. Or sometimes there is some calamity and uh, a person will have to undergo some tribulations to learn from that calamity before the Lord actually corrects the situation or allows it to be corrected. So we can't see the whole picture, but we can pray in a very, what we say, undemanding way. And that is, that should be done. We should pray, but leaving it up to Krishna. And as you mentioned at the end of your, your question, uh, if Krishna grants that, do we, be, do we become a little bit proud? Well, no, because if we allow him to make the choice, there's no question of our becoming proud or not proud. We, we shouldn't try to control Krishna, but Krishna is controlled by his devotee when the devotee has love for Krishna. So that, that control of Krishna comes automatically when there is love and not in anything else. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. I don't see uh, any other questions. Or oh, Jagadish, you know, go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Dhanur mm -hmm. Pana, Maharaj. All glories, Prabhupada, all glories to you. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question like, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Bhishan Pitama characteristics, as we know, he the 12, one of the 12 Mahajan, but knowing he favored or he supported to Driyodhan, uh, is the like, uh, just I'm trying to understand that, that kind of personality, why he supported in the wrong way, though he knows that Krishna is the urgent side and everything is Dharma is there, and is he following that, uh, like the just Krishna desire or by his own some of the reactions or uh, uh, what why he favored Driyodhan knowingly? Yeah, that question has been asked before and it's, it's a matter of discussion, but the conclusion of the discussion is two things. There is an external reason and there's an internal reason. The external reason is known to all of us, and that is uh, Bhishma Dev, although he was a Kshatriya, he had no place. So Duryodhan gave him a chance to exhibit his characteristics as Kshatriya. Actually, Bhishma Dev was meant to rule the world, but because he was not in the uh, situated in the proper ashram, he couldn't, he couldn't rule the world. And so he was somewhat disenfranchised because of his situation. So Doya Dodin showed some kindness by giving Grandfather Vishnu a position and taking care of him and giving him everything he needed. So he felt obliged. And Prabhupada said, if someone takes care of you, there is a certain obligation that comes by way of that relationship. <clears throat> so in that relationship, he, he was feeling obliged to do it. But that's the external reason. The internal reason is the more deeper and the more correct reason. Bhishma Dev was so powerful, and I use that word very strongly, that he could have annihilated the entire Pandava army by himself. <laughs> there would have been no question. And he fought. He didn't fight to his full capacity because if he did, there would be no chance <laughs> for the Pandavas to win. 
Uh, he was powerful. He was 170 years old when he was on the battlefield, but still fully capable. And at the same time, he had that desire that he could live as long as he wanted to. And so, but he wanted to show the world some very strong message why he went opposite on the opposite side of Krishna. And that message is really the fundamental principle of this whole pastime. That understanding that Bhishma Dev was so powerful he could annihilate the entire Pandava army. But he wanted to show that if you're no matter how great, no matter how powerful, no matter how qualified you are, if you're against Krishna, you lose. That's the message here. So we cannot estimate in a material sense because Krishna never loses. <laughs> but people go against the laws of God. They go against the, the Lord directly. There are people who actually believe in God, but they purposely, because of their own selfish desires, go against the will of God. They know God is powerful. But at the same time, they go against God. But Bhishma Dev wanted to show, no matter who you are, no matter how qualified and intelligent you are, if you're against the Supreme Lord, you will lose. That was the mess. That's the internal reason for Bhishma Dev accepting the side of their Duryodhana. So you, we can accept both, both internal and external as being valid, but the internal reason is the message that is the devotional message. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Maharaj. Does that help you a little bit? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, it's clear. No one could fight against Bhishma Day. It was not, powerful, not possible. And when he, want, when he want, wanted to show his prowess, he simply smashed Arjuna's chariot to bits with his arrows. It was, Arjuna had no, and Arjuna was so, was, was one of the most qualified fighters on the battlefield. But he couldn't, he, he had no chance against Bhishma Dev. Yeah, so that was the message. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Please accept my humble obeisances. How glorious to you. Hare Krishna, nice to see you. Hare Krishna. Nice to see you also, Maharaj. Maharaj, I had a uh, question. Uh, we hear about Bhishma Pitamaha that he has uh, that uh, boon that he can do his body whenever he wants. And then he waited till the sun moves in the northern direction, which you know, probably happens on 14th of January, Sankranti. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we hear also about Bhisma Panchak at the end of Kartik. So I'm kind of a little bit confused in these two timings. Mm -hmm. What is, what is the actual meaning of Bish, Bishma Panchaka? I, I'm not exactly clear on that one. Uh, what does it mean? The Pancha means five, right? In five days. Yeah. Five days. So, I mean, I've heard that that's also a time when Bishma Pitama left. So it means I'm kind of, I mean, timing wise, it kind of throws me off. To me, it is all right that to understand that oh, he left on 14. Or somewhere near Sankranti. Yeah, it says it, it says in the Bhagavad time he waited to the north the sun went into the northern hemisphere, which is yeah. Makara Sankranti. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's been said by by Srila Prabhupada in his lectures also. 
So um, I'm not sure what the Vishnu Panchaka is. And, uh, I never really investigated that. <laughs> so <laughs> all I know is people eat fruit for five days. All I, that's all I know. <laughs> Okay. It's part of Kartik using. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maharaj and Prabhu, uh, what I heard is uh, recently from one of our ISKCON devotees last year. Uh, b- this is in Padma Puran or uh, another Puran where Bhishma Pitama following the, because he was, Lord Krishna was explaining to the Pandavas that uh, uh, are to Bhishma Pitama, how Pandavas did this fasting, five days of fasting. Uh, or Bhishma Pitama, other way. So then you also follow, like Bhishma Pitama, you can attend. So that way, so Bhishma Pitama did this five days fasting. It doesn't mean he is ready to leave at that time. Mm-hmm. He did the five days of fasting um, completely. Uh, there was a another pastime where, uh, yeah, these Pandavas in the previous lifetime, they were under one king and then um, they were attracted to one of the, the queen who was dan- dancer. Then um, they were at the beach and then they were uh, fasting completely uh, somehow or other uh, without even knowing those five days uh, all five of them then they got the merit somehow or other. these are the very auspicious Damodra month days and uh, unknowingly they they got that merit so this is what has been explained to Bhishma Pitama so Bhishma Pitama also did it uh, those five days so that's what I heard. This is one of the prana from, I think, Iskwan Dwaraka, one of the devotees was sharing, giving us references. Okay, and, that's a nice, yeah, it's a nice, uh, you know, if you can, you can, if you have that reference, you can send it to me. I'd like to learn about it. Sure, Maharaj. Yeah, yeah, just send it to me on my email. It sounds interesting because it's, it's basically about fasting in those five days. So. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. He waited two months and then he, he left uh, Uttarayan. But the Bishma Panchak specifically is referring to those five days of fasting following uh, Lord Krishna's uh, sharing that past time of how Pandavas did in the past life. So that's why they are so dear to me. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. There's a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. The, reason, the reasons why they were... Uh, forced to go into the forest for so many years was also due to activities in the past. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that happened in, in previous lives with the Pandavas, especially with Draupadi, that manifested when they came as, you know, the Pandavas and, and Draupadi. So, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, you got your answer, Mahupati. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, we're right up to uh, the hour. I, um, I have a class coming up in the temple. It's the Sunday feast program here in, in Slovenia. So I have to get to that. So... Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to all the devotees. Thank you very much for coming on our channel, Maharaj. Yeah. It's so nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to be here and uh, be able to. I always feel a special attraction to New Jersey. I was going to come. This is my last trip, but then I got sick. Because I got sick, I wasn't able to make it. I had actually plan to come to the temple in, in central Jersey yeah. and right around that time this illness arrived and, and it changed so I'll try again next time Right. Thank you very much. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. Sambhira Bhakti Vrinda Ki Jai. 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 J